So what's going on in Jeremiah 41? Well, I found a pretty cool website that actually explains it. I'm going to put the link up uh, on Moodle and on YouTube. The murder of Gedaliah, governor of the land. Now, who is Gedaliah? If you remember now, uh, Judah, the southern kingdom, has been conquered by the Babylonians, which Jeremiah had been predicting for years. It finally happens completely, and they destroyed the temple. We don't hear about this in Jeremiah. We hear about it in some of the history chronicles elsewhere in the Bible. But the temple has been destroyed, and the king has been killed, and he's been um, the Jews have been exiled, and only a remnant has remained, and they are being governed by Gedaliah, who is a puppet ruler put in place by the Babylonians, similar to Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of that region for the sake of the conquering Romans. In the same way, that's what Gedaliah is doing for the sake of the conquering Babylonians. But Gedaliah is murdered by this guy named Ishmael. Who is Ishmael? Well, they quote various sources here. Ishmael came from a collateral line of the Davidic family through Elishama, son of David. Now, that's very interesting. Ishmael is related to King David, and therefore he's probably upset that his potential to rule as king has been usurped by the Babylonians. Well, as they point out in some of the commentary that I found, he didn't wait as David waited while he was being pursued by Saul for God to make him king. He created a bloodbath. First of all, he kills Gedaliah, even though Gedaliah had been warned that this was about to happen. Look at, just in the last chapter, Johanan says to Gedaliah, do you certainly know that Baalis, the king of the Ammonites, has sent Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, to murder you? But Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, did not believe them. So Ishmael is not just operating for his own interest. He's been suborned to murder the governor by the Ammonites, who are among the many enemies of the Jews in that region. And so he's working for, in effect, the Gentiles, or a foreign power, comes in, and he murders the governor that's been placed on the throne by the Babylonians. Once the Babylonians find this out, they're not going to be happy. So everybody in Jerusalem knows they're going to suffer for this. But in addition to this, Ishmael kills a whole bunch of other fellows. And this is strange. These fellows that he kills, who are they? Well, they came with shaved beards. All these were signs of deep mourning, probably on account of the destruction of the city. These are Jews from other regions outside of the southern kingdom of Judah. These are Jews in what would have been the northern kingdom or Israel, though the northern kingdom of Israel a hundred years prior had been overtaken by the Assyrians. Now, both parts of Israel have been conquered, but these men come with signs of mourning, probably mourning the fact that the temple has been destroyed and Nebuchadnezzar has become victorious and conquered Judah. But what does Ishmael do? He kills them. He kills 80 of them or 70 of the 80. The 10 he spares tell him that they've got food and stuff that they could give to him. Well, eventually there's a battle between Johanan and Ishmael, and then we are told that Johanan moves into um, Egypt. And so, uh, let's see. Yeah, well, 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 well. I tried to mark this down here, but as you can see, something happened to my highlight. What on earth happened to my highlight? Well, here in the last part, Johanan now decide, decided to go as quickly as possible to Egypt. He and the army officers with him feared reprisals when the news of Gedaliah's assassination reached Babylon. So the hero of the piece, Johanan, or Johanan, however it would be said, he takes vengeance and defeats Ishmael, and as soon as he appears, Ishmael's forces abandon Ishmael and come to the side of Johanan because Ishmael was just a brute. But still in all, even though he defeats Ishmael, he's got to run into Egypt. So you have one whole group of Jews who have been taken captive in Babylon, and then you have this heroic little band who have to flee into Egypt, which is the historical place of slavery of the Jews that Moses led them out of. So that's all that's going on. And as they point out in that commentary, things are chaotic. There's a power vacuum. 
if God forbid anything like this ever happened in America or Canada or wherever you live, the same thing would happen. There would be battles and assassinations and chaos and looting and so forth because there's no power structure anymore. Briefly, since I've been talking a bit, let's look at uh, a part or two here from um, Revelations. And some of this uh, you guys should recognize from the Mass, since you're all good Catholics. First of all, this is what is sung in heaven. Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. This is where Handel gets the Alleluia chorus. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Alleluia. He's quoting here from the end of Revelations, because we're coming up to the end of the book. But then, here's other stuff. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. Now we start to see what becomes a consistent image of a wedding. The Lamb, Jesus, is to marry his bride, the church, who has been made pure and given pure garments because of his own sacrifice. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. The church is made pure and beautiful by the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, this is the angel speaking to John as John sees this vision, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. What does that remind you of? Well, this is at the Eucharist, at what we call the fraction of the bread, at the breaking of the consecrated host. Behold the Lamb of God, the priest says. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. So they're combining what John the Baptist says of Jesus, behold the Lamb of God, and then they're picking up right here from Revelations 19, Blessed are those called to the Supper of the Lamb. One of the things that Scott Hahn does is when he went to his first Mass, I believe he was still Presbyterian, he was overwhelmed at the amount of Scripture that's in the Mass, in the actual celebration of the Eucharist, not just the readings, including that quote. There's a lot in there from Revelations. That's one of the most important ones. Okay, more tomorrow. God willing.